Good morning, church. It's so nice to see this place packed up. And it's been a while, you know, since we've had that. Um, why don't you turn around and, you know, greet somebody this morning? It's fine if you don't want to shake hands, but if, if you want to, that's great. Also, welcome to the people upstairs. Why don't we, why don't we stand up as we spend some time and worship God? We have a lot of new people joining us. I mean, maybe maybe you're old, but like, I can't tell because of the mask. So, my parents are here as well. It's a it's a joy to have them also. Um, okay, let me pray. Okay, before we start, Father, we want to thank you for this day. We want to thank you that you are you are with us, Lord. That you are in control. That you that you are involved in our lives, Lord. You know how our week has been. You know how, where each one of us are, Lord God. I commit each person who is here into your hands. I commit myself, my team, and each, each person who is here and who is joining online into your hands, Lord. Father, I pray that you would meet us where we are. That you would comfort us where we need comforting, Lord. That your hand would guide us where we need guidance. In Jesus' name I pray, and I commit this time in your hands. Amen. You guys know this song, sing it out. I know he rescued my soul. His blood has covered my sin. I believe. I believe my shame he's taking away. Oh, oh, my pain is using his name. I believe. Oh, yeah, I believe. Now, raise a banner. My Lord has conquered the grave. My Redeemer lives. My Redeemer lives, my Redeemer lives, my Redeemer lives. Oh. I know He rescued my soul, oh I know His blood has covered my sin, I believe. Away. My pain is healed in His name. I believe. I believe. I raise a banner, 'cause my Lord has conquered the grave. My Redeemer lives. My Redeemer lives. My Redeemer. today, tomorrow, forevermore. And I love how the bridge says, you lift my burdens and I will rise with you. He lifts our burdens. God, we worship you. We praise you. 
for you have been good to us you are good Lord God where you are Lord there is fullness of joy in your presence let's sing this song together You are beautiful beyond description To marvelous for words To wonderful for comprehension Like nothing ever seen or heard Your infinite wisdom Who can fathom mercy so free You are beautiful beyond description Majesty and form above And I stand I You 
our God alone. Let's sing this. In the good times and bad, you are on your throne. You are God alone. Oh, and right now, in the good times and bad, you are on the throne. You are God alone. Exodus event in the Bible and I want to share a verse which has been encouraging to me personally this past week um, it's from Deuteronomy 31 verses 7 and 8 it says then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel be strong and courageous for you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them 
and you shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear. Do not be dismayed. That's the God that we worship. He walks beside us. He goes before us. He doesn't leave us or forsake us. When He calls us somewhere, He's going to be there.
why don't you take a moment and just just come before God right now and let us lay down things that worry us that make us anxious that seem like they have they have been holding us back that seem like they have been holding us as slaves and let me pray for you right now Father God you know what we are going through Lord what each person here is going through Father I pray over them I pray that you would that you would rescue them Lord God wherever they may be that your peace would guard their hearts that we would not forget your faithfulness and your goodness and your sovereignty and your love and your justice and your might that we would not forget that you are God that you would lead us, lead each one of us where you want us to be and where you have called us. And Father, for those who are still seeking your calling for their life, Lord, that you would reveal it to them. That we would rest in the fact that you know where you have called us. name I pray. Amen. A thousand times I've failed till your mercy remained. Should I stumble again? Well, I'm caught in your grace. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all things. It will above all else my purpose remains. The art of losing myself in bringing you praise everlasting your light will shine when all else fades never ending your glory goes beyond all things my heart and my soul I give you control consume me from the Side out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out, Lord.
consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and grace. with his tithes and our offerings. Let us come into his presence with grateful hearts and worship him with grateful hearts for he is for all that he has been to us. Shoot 
intervention in our lives we want to thank you that you are perfect that you are good that you are kind you are patient with us I pray that you would speak to each one of us through your word right now that you would give us wisdom and ears to listen in Jesus name I pray Amen you may be seated Check, check. The reason they brought the piano so close is next time I'll be sitting on it and preaching. <laughs> Good morning, how are you doing this morning? I know masks are there, but you know, it's not uh, soundproof. How are you doing this morning? Good to have you here. Good to have people joining us online. Um, we have some announcements, some family matters to share with you. And uh, it's not here, but that's fine. Let me, let me announce those matters. Uh, first is we are going back on, uh, in person, not online. I hope we don't go back online. But we are going back in person. Uh, we have only been, already been in person but slowly and steadily, we are opening up our Sunday uh, ministries in person. We've had Sunday school, kids school online for the last two years. And finally, we are going back in person next Sunday. That is 3rd April. I circulated a text and some people were confused as to whether should we come this Sunday at 9 a.m. If you came at 9 a.m. this Sunday, you have been automatically induced into our uh, ushering and greeting teams. So if you came at 9 a.m., I'm glad you did. Uh, but we are ser starting two services next Sunday. First one is at 9 a.m. That's next Sunday, 3rd April, 9 a.m. And the second one is not at 10. Today you came at 10. The second one is at 10.15. So 9 a.m. and 10.15. Sunday school for parents. Sunday school is parallel to the second service, 10, 15 a.m. So if you have kids starting from the age 4 all the way 12, please bring them along. Sunday school is at 10, 15 a.m. On track, which is our youth, uh, starting from age 13, we are, we are moving into a grade system rather than age system. But 13 and above, if you are there, please come along. It's during 10, 15 a.m. as well. Now, when you start back in person, with online, you can still manage with fewer people, 
right, for your volunteers. But when you start back in person, you need volunteers, all right? Some of you have resigned and sat back while we were online, but we are recruiting again. And list yourself, okay? So please, we need people for greeting and ushering. That is your welcome team on Sunday morning for two services. We'll only take you for one service. That's fine. Uh, so two services. Then we've got Sunday school. If you have any inclination to teach kids, if you don't run away from them, please come. We'll train you. We'll equip you to teach them. All right? So Sunday school on track. If you are above a certain age, 20 and above, and if you have been through on track, you know what on track is. Even if you haven't been through, uh, please come. We need leaders for our youth as well. So we are, we are recruiting. Please enlist yourself. And uh, we would start uh, next week with everything in person. So those are some of the announcements uh, that we have. Uh, but we have one more thing. It's, it's, a, it's a great announcement, and it's called Bands of Marriage. And we have not one, two of them today. Uh, I see Sakshi is here. Is Anne here? Oh, Anne is there. Hey, Anne. Uh, do meet them and congratulate them. They're about to get married. So if you, if you don't know them, uh, well, see the most glowing people around. <laughs> All right, let me read the bands of marriage. We announce the bands of marriage between Akshay Umar Reddy, son of Mr. Suresh Babu Umar Reddy of Bible Believers Church, and Sakshi Beatrice Verma, daughter of Mr. Devinder Kumar Verma of Delhi Bible Fellowship, to be solemnized on the 7th of April 2022 at YMCA Suregaon Satal. If anyone has just cause why these two should not lawfully be wed together in holy matrimony, please present your objection in writings. This is the second reading of the bands of marriage. We announce the bands of marriage between Sam Daniel Matthews, son of Mr. Denny Matthews of All People's Church, Bangalore, and Anne Matthew, daughter of Mr. Santosh Matthew Thomas of Delhi Bible Fellowship, to be solemnized on the 23rd of April, 2022, at Syax Chapel, Bangalore. If anyone has just cause why these two should not lawfully be wed together in holy matrimony, please present your objection in writing. This is the first reading of the bands of marriage. Let's pray as we get into God's Word. Father, it is true that you are God alone, that you're enthroned over this earth, that you are majesty. You are king. You are the creator. You're the holy one. You're the magnificent one. You're the perfect one. And we are not. We know we're close. And yet, Lord, you concern yourself with the daily matters, the mundane details of our lives. How great is that? How assuring is that? How beautiful is that? That we have you in our corner of the ring. And that's enough at times. Although we don't feel like that, but you say that my grace is sufficient for you. That my strength is made perfect, is made complete, in your weakness. And so, Lord, we acknowledge that we are weak and that you are strong. There's so much brokenness here. There's so much pain here. There's, there's sickness. There is, there is death. There is chaos. There is separation. There is severed relationships. There is just so much going on. Oh, Lord, would you intervene? Would you bring healing? Would you bring restoration? Through your word, through your presence, through your people, through your power. For we are your people. This is your church. This is your word. So speak to us, for I ask in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Now, India came into the 2015 Cricket World Cup as hot favorites. They were the hot favorites and they were the reigning champions. They won the World Cup in 2011. And all the sports pundits had put their bets on the blue wagon. Now, the first battle or the first match in the group stage was a cracker. It was India versus Pakistan. And India, in that match, in that starting match, clinched a whooping 76-run victory from their arch rivals. And Pakistan was just the beginning. That was just the battle they needed to win to trail the blaze of victories that they encountered thereon. They pulverized in their group stage the likes of South Africa, West Indies, UAE, Ireland, Zimbabwe. And quarterfinals was a breeze because they defeated Bangladesh with 109 runs. I was checking the statistics and historically any team that has won all the group stage matches, all of them has gone on to win the championship. Any team that has won all the battles has gone on to win the war. It was a semi-final, the one before the big one. And India was playing against the host country, Australia. Australia mounted a respectable yet daunting 328-run target in a 50-over game. But the people were sure that the only team with the batting experience and the batting depth that can surmount that great tor total, uh, target and total was India. India started well. They managed to, to put up a first wicket partnership of about 75 runs. They had good run rate, but then India collapsed. One after the other, the wickets kept fell, falling and people kept failing. There was some glimmer of hope here and there, but India collapsed. Six batsmen got out in single digit. And India lost by 95 runs. India became the only team to have won all the group stage matches and yet lose the championship. Win all the battles and lose the war. You see, we all fight several wars in our lives. And within those wars, we fight several battles in our lives. Some fight the war of health. And, and the battle within that war is improvement or regression in their health. Two steps forward, five steps back, there, there is victory and there is loss in those battles. Then the, but the war is either complete recovery or a flat line. Some of us fight the war of relationships, whether it is parenting, whether it is marriage, whether it is friendships. And we go back and forth. We have conflicts. Each conflict is a battle. We are either winning or we are either losing. Again, two steps forward, five steps back. But the... But the war is, are we going to see these relationships through to the end? That's the war. Some of us fighting a health war, some of us fighting relationship war, some of us fighting financial war. But while that is individually possible for each one of you, individually relevant to each one of you, one battle or one war that we are all waging is the war of faith. If you call yourself a follower of Lord Jesus, if you call yourself a Christian, that you are in that war. You know, doubt that is elicited by every accident, accident every tragedy, every death, every chaos, every setback is a battle. We lose sometimes and we win sometimes. Some of you are in that stage right now, where there is a battle that is raging around your faith, with your faith, and you seem to be losing. But some of you are like India in the group stage. You are cruising. You're gaining victory one after the other. 
and you're pretty comfortable. But don't get complacent. So I want to ask and answer a question this morning is how can we make sure that we win this war? It's not easy, as you know it. How can we make sure that we live our lives in such a way that at the end we stand victorious? We win this war of faith. Because guess what? Health, finances, relationships have temporal implications. But the war of faith has eternal ramifications. Temporal, eternal. So how can we live our lives so that we win this war? And the answer is in Judges chapter 6 to 8. Judges chapter 6 to 8. We've been in a series called Imperfect Saviors in the book of Judges. And this morning, we want to look at three things as we look at these three chapters. We want to look at reluctance. We want to look at redemption and relapse. Reluctance, redemption, and relapse. So let's look at reluctance first. Now, chapter 5 ended on a great high. Right? We last week looked at Barak and, and Deborah. I was going to say Barak and Michelle, but no. There was no Michelle there. There was Deborah there. Barak and Deborah. And it ended on a high note, which ended with a duet with Barak and Deborah, praising God, exalting his name, just commending his sovereignty and how he won the battle and won the war for Israel. But as one commentator said, chapter 6 begins with a loud thud on the terra firma, on the dry land, that high has come crashing down. Look at verse, chapter 6, verse 1. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight, so the Lord turned them over to Midian for seven years. The Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord. The beginning is similar to chapter 4. That's the cycle in the, in the book of Judges. God raises leaders, leaders deliver them, people go back to their idolatry, and then God again raises a leader. So that's the cycle, and the starting is similar to chapter 4. And yet again, we see that God raises up a prophet to come and prophesy to them. Again, similar to chapter 4. In chapter 4, Deborah comes on the scene, and Deborah begins to call the shots, and she's commanding everybody, and there begins the rescue process for the Israelites. But here, this time around, there's something different. The prophet is not doing what Deborah did. Instead, Instead, what the prophet is doing is reminding them how far they have stooped in sin. The prophet is reminding them what God had done for them and in response, what they have done in their lives. Let's look at uh, verse 7. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites. He said to them, this is what the Lord God of Israel has said. I brought you up from Egypt, and I took you out of that place of slavery. I rescued you from Egypt's power and from the power of all who oppressed you. I drove them out before you and gave their land to you. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose lands you are now living, but you have disobeyed me. God says to them, you have disobeyed me. See, there are times when God calls us to reckon with our sin before he sends a savior. There are times in our lives when God calls us to reckon with our sins before he sends his redemption. He calls us to name the sin. Because more often than not, in our wars, or the cause of our, cause of our wars, is us. There are times when things are out of our control, when we can't control other people's behaviors, we can't control circumstances, and we are in war because of that. But more often than not, think about it, 
the wars that we are waging, the battles that we are fighting are because of our own sin and our own brokenness. And God says, deal with it. Acknowledge it. Identify it. Identify it. In our family, we have a phrase called naming the sin. Right? Wherein we just don't say sorry to one another. We, we ask each other, what are you sorry for? What are you seeking forgiveness for? Name the sin. Don't just generally say sorry. So if Bella is coming or if I'm going or Janice is coming and we're just saying sorry generally, no, that won't do it. You identify what you have done. Name the sin. And that's what God is saying. You have disobeyed me. Realize it. Reckon with it. Identify it. Deal with it. Deal with it. See, God has given us redemption already. We sing of His beautiful redemption time and again, every Sunday morning, through the week, And while we were yet sinners, God sent Christ to die for us. That's there. But redemption is no excuse from you not reckoning with your sin. If you do not reckon with your sin, if we do not reckon with our sin and identify as sin, then this grace is cheap, then this sacrifice means nothing. And that's what God says, you have disobeyed me. Before I send you a savior, you need to recognize your sin. Imagine if the story had ended here. Imagine if this chapter would not have gone ahead. Imagine if this book would not have gone ahead. And the last line of this chapter and this book was, you have disobeyed me. God would still be justified. God would still be justified to leave Israel at their fate, oppressed by Midians. And their oppression was no normal oppression. If you read till chapter 5, nothing like this has happened before. Israel's have been just booted out of their land. They are now seeking refuge in hard mountainous terrain. There is nothing to eat. There is no animal. There is no correlation between those two sentences. Crops aren't there. And Israel is on the run. God would still be just if Israel had to spend the rest of their life in exile. Left alone by God. Because God holds up his end of the bargain. He said to the Israelites, I'll bless you, you obey me. Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, the covenant promises. If you disobey me, you will suffer. What does God do? Verse 11, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak tree in Ophrah, owned by Joash the Abetzerite. He arrived while Joash's son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press so he could hide it, hide it, mark it, hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared and said to him, the Lord is with you, courageous warrior. Look at Gideon's response. Who are you? Where is God? Why is God not here? If God was here, why these things are happening to us? If God is good, if God is powerful, if God is what he says or who he says he is, if God is what, if if what he has done, we sang about the Exodus song, if that's what he has done, the great miracles, why are we in this deep trouble? Where are you? God says, I'm with you. Have I not sent you, O courageous warrior? Thrice, God assures Gideon, I am with you. You are it. You are the salvation. I will be with you certainly. And Gideon says, 
uh, I don't believe you. In the second movie, Narnia, the Prince Caspian, uh, when the kings of old, kings and queens of old, return to Narnia, they see a very different Narnia. It's a savage land. The animals don't talk anymore, the, the trees won't dance anymore, and it's, it's a strange land. They're not familiar with this land. The last time they remember Narnia, it was happy, it was joyful, it was just amazing. There was life in everything, and this time around, there's nothing there. And so their first act of redemption is that they, they save that, that dwarf from drowning. Right? They, they throw that dwarf and these guys, they save the dwarf from drowning. And the dwarf comes up and narrates the whole story about the inv invaders, the Talmarines and everything. And the siblings say, where is Aslan? Why did Aslan not come? The great lion, the king. And this dwarf has this puzzled face, a puzzled look on his face, and he's angry at the same time. He's like, what? Aslan has been MIA for centuries. He abandoned us. He is not coming back. Despite of Lucy's persistence, no, he's going to come. This, this guy, this, this dear little friend, as Lucy called him, he says, he's not coming back. I don't believe him. You see, the problem for him, that dwarf, was not, not the existence of Aslan. But the problem was that for him, Aslan existed only in the tales that the elders would tell around bonfire. And same is the problem with Gideon. He is no problem, he has no problem in believing in the existence of Yahweh, but the problem for him is that Yahweh exists only in tales and bedtime stories that the elders of the community, the elders of the congregation would tell them around the bonfire. That's why he does not believe because he has not seen, he has not experienced the power of God, the presence of God, the purpose of God in their lives. And for some of us, that's the reality. You know, although we have called ourselves the followers of Lord Jesus, called ourselves Christians, but we've never really experienced the palpable presence of the Lord. And I'm, I, I don't mean it in a, in, a, in a very real sense. I mean it in the sense of knowing and such deep experiential knowledge of God that you can feel His presence around you. You can, you can grasp His promises and take His word on its face value and believe. I'm not talking about a mystical experience here. Please don't get me wrong. That we have never experienced that power of God, the, the, the working of God in our lives. And some of us, unlike Gideon, have experienced all of that. We have experienced all of that. But still, like Gideon, we have a huge list of excuses and reasons why we do not measure up for the call that God has for us. Gideon had all the excuses possible. I don't know you, who are you, I don't believe in you, but you know what, I'm the weakest, I'm economically weak, I'm physically weak, I'm the youngest, etc., etc., etc. God is calling some of us to fight the battle at workplace. To be honest, to live with integrity. God has given us, some of us, to fight the war, not the battle, the war of loving your spouse despite of the hurt. Some of you are fighting a war of addiction. And God is not present for us. That's what we believe. For some of us, either because we have not experienced His power, and so we don't know Him, and we say, uh, where is He? 
or we think we are good enough by ourselves. God, I don't need you. See, Gideon doesn't get it. It's not about him. Yes, he's perhaps the weakest. Yes, he's economically, physically, financially weak. But it's not about him. The angel of the Lord comes and says the first thing to him, Oh, courageous warrior. He's hiding, by the way. (laughs) That doesn't compute. But here's the fact, if God says courageous warrior, he is a courageous warrior. Because guess what? Who's going to fight his war or his battles? God says, I am with you. My power is with you. My presence is with you. I am with you. I am with you. See, whether we lay down our arms and don't fight the battle or the war, or we go alone without God, in both cases, the problem is pride. One is inverted pride, one is just pride. The problem is pride. Oh, I'm so poor. Oh, I'm so weak. Nobody can help me. No amount of sacrifice can help me. And here I am. I'm too strong. The problem is pride. And that causes doubt and reluctance. And you see, doubt is okay. Doubt is good. Tomorrow I'm going to get a letter from DBF that I'm fired. Doubt is okay. Because if handled well, doubt takes you from one level of faith to the other. So if you have doubt, don't don't think fatally about yourself. Parents, kids. Doubt is okay. But when the writing on the wall is clear and then you doubt, that's pride. You get it? When God comes to you and says, Thrice, I am with you, and still you doubt, that's pride. Gideon says, okay, I want to test you. He tests God and he says, okay, I believe you. I've experienced you, the great Yahweh, the great king, I've experienced you now, I believe you. God says, okay, tear down the altars of Baal. Your father's Baal. He says, okay, I'll go at night because I'm scared. He takes ten people with him, tears down the altars, does it. And you would feel now that Gideon has experienced God, now that God has spoken to him, now he'd be this courageous warrior. Go down to verse 36. That's that famous verse or passage of putting the fleece out. Twice, twice Gideon tests the Lord. Twice he says to the Lord, I'm going to put out the fleece, you do something miraculous and I'll believe you that you're sending me. Twice. He does that. The question is, what excuse does he have now? To some of you, God is calling you to trust him with your marriage. To some of you, God is trusting you, calling you to trust him with your with your relationships, with your children, with your future. You have experienced him. But you still need to tear down the altar of your pride. He says, I'm with you. But you won't believe me unless you tear down this altar of your pride. See, just a side note. The scripture calls that that, that, that Baal altar, Gideon's father's altar. At times, this doubt and reluctance is because of the enemy within, not outside. 
just a side note think about it so we saw gideon's reluctance now let's look at god's redemption gideon finally pulls himself up by his bootstraps and he rallies the people he he tears down the altars he does everything god wants him to he rallies in fact 32000 men from all the tribes but god says to him 30000 32000 are too much you don't need that many God shrinks his army shrinks his army shrinks his army and brings it down to 300 men just 300 on the other side if you see on the other side if you see time and again the description of this midianite army is that of swarm of locusts they're uncountable they're 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 innumerable and in face of those odds in face of that army god says just 300 men just 300 men not one more not one less but this one is still fearful gideon is still fearful verse 10 chapter 7 god says to gideon if you are still afraid to attack go down to the camp with pura your servant and see what they are saying verse 13 when gideon Uh, arrived he heard a man that is a midianite man telling another man about a dream he had the man said look i had a dream i saw a stale cake of barley bread rolling down into the midianite camp it hit a tent so hard that it knocked over and turned it upside down the tent just collapsed and the other man said listen to it without a doubt this symbolizes the sword of gideon son of joash the israelite god is handing midian and all the army over to him you see god is orchestrating everything he's even putting dreams in in the opposition's head all gideon needs to do is follow the lead all he has to do is is this do what simon says anybody simon here Okay. But I admit it's not easy. It's not easy following God's lead, especially when the odds are stacked against you. 300 men versus whatever. Huge army. It's hard. It's hard. But he follows through. I give it to Gideon. All right while we are taking his case i give it to him that he does it he follows through but here's the thing the reason why gideon was able to follow through is because at every step god is removing obstacles god is is fighting every battle for him so that he wins the war god is removing every obstacle from gideon's path while i was in the us i got acquainted with what they call american football i'm still wrapping my head around it why it's called football but that's how their game their rules okay now in this game of football there is offense and defense okay two things or or, or two tactics team can play when they're in offense there is a position called running back now they don't run backwards Okay, it is called running back and the only role this this player has or this position has is to take the ball take the pass from the quarterback and run right run towards the goal run as fast as as far as they can go that's their job all right the other players meanwhile are removing obstacles from their path all the heavy tackles that are coming towards this person who's running they're removing all of that so that this person wins the battle reaches to the end and make sure that the war is won you see god does that he punts you the ball he hands you the ball and he says run i'll remove the obstacles i'll take all the heavy tackles that come your way you just run be ready to run trust me 
He's like that sniper hiding. And he says, run. Run in the field. Get the target. Win the war. I've got your back. But run. I've got all your battles. You just go and win the war. Just go and win the war. You see, it takes stamina and strength to run. And Gideon runs. Gideon runs. God at times calls us to fight battles for others. You know, we call him our king, right? I mean, his enemies are our enemies, his people and are our people. And so at times God calls you to to fight these battles for others. And he says, I'm with you. Run. Run. So we saw Gideon's reluctance. We saw God's redemption through Gideon. And now let's look at the relapse. The victory is won. In fact, Gideon has gone ahead and captured more countries than were needed in his rage. It just show us that the victory is getting in his head. All right, he's, he's becoming too big for his shoes. But finally, Israel has managed to throw off the Midian yoke from their necks and they are free. Chapter 8, verse 22. The men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, you, your son, your grandson, for you have delivered us from Midian's power, not to God, to Gideon. And Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. People are saying, you rule over us. You are our hero. You are our savior. Rule over us. And Gideon got it right this time. He says, no, 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 no. I'm not your savior. God will rule over you. He's got it right this time. Or has he? See the following verses, what Gideon does. He says, okay, I'm not going to rule you. But you're going to pay me tribute. Okay, take off your gold earrings. Give it to me. One. Apart from other ornaments. And he gathers and he gathers gold weighing about 20 kilos, if you do the calculation. That's a lot of gold. And he fashions this ephod, which is a a priestly vestment. It's a vest that priests would wear during worship time. And this larger-than-life ephod, he wrecks it in his hometown, which is only meant to be used in in the tabernacle or temple. And the scripture tells us that people worshipped this ephod. Can you think of a similar incident in the scripture? The golden calf. The golden calf. God had just delivered them through the Red Sea and they erect a golden calf. God has just delivered them from the Midianites and they have erected this ephod. Abimelech, uh, Gideon goes ahead and has many wives, concubines, sons. In fact, he names one of his sons as Abimelech. Abimelech means my father is king. How ironical. He says, I'm not going to be your king, but he names his son, my father is king. (laughs) Oh, we don't get it, do we? Israel enjoyed peace, but that peace was without worship. That peace was without God. It was pseudo-peace. And we do that at times, and I want to close with that. At times when either we put down our arms and don't fight the war or we fight the war by ourselves, we enjoy some sort of peace. There is this temporary peace, but that peace is without God and without worship. Because the person you're worshipping in that peace is you. That's what pride does. It makes you the center of everything makes us the center of everything. 
what caused Israel and Gideon's relapse was pride. Pride in either their strength, their imperfect savior, or their inability to do anything. You see, pride is the biggest enemy of faith, not doubt. Pride makes you believe that you're either your own savior or that you're so wretched a sinner that even Christ's death cannot redeem you. My friend, God is fighting a battle of faith. He wants us to win the war. As Paul says to Timothy in his last days, I have fought the good fight, I have run the race. God wants us to say that. God wants us to say that. He fights our battles because he wants us to focus on winning the war. Can you trust God with your battles? Can you and I trust him with his battles? He's already given us his son and our savior, our Lord Jesus, who has already forgiven us, who has already pardoned all our sin, all our failures, all our falterings. But he says, run, fight, fight not to receive redemption, fight from redemption. My grace is with you, my strength is with you, I am with you, fight. Would you let go of your pride and trust God? Would you fight? Let's pray. Father, it's not easy. And I admit it for myself. The battering, the test of faith every day, it's not easy. It's not easy. And some of us are thinking, Pastor, yes, it's easy to preach but hard to live. And I agree with that. But thanks be to you that you have given us your presence, your power, through your spirit to overcome because your son overcame and he is with us he stands with us and grieves with us and and loves us and lifts us up open our eyes to see give us the faith to trust to win the war We might lose battles here and there, but help us win the war. Help us lay aside our pride and trust you. For you, you alone are God. You alone are our Savior. You alone are our Creator. There's no one else like you. song again you are God alone you are God alone from before time began you were on your throne you are God alone right now in the good times and bad you are on your God alone, you are God alone, 
from before time began You were on your throne You are God alone And right now In the good times and bad You are on your throne You are God calling some of us to trust you with their relationships with their health with their with their life you call us to leave the outcome to you because if the outcome comes from you we will always win because none can contend with your power none can substitute your presence and none can trump your plan so help us trust you set aside our pride and trust you and may the love that extravagant and prodigious love of god and the grace the grace of our lord jesus christ and the fellowship the wisdom and, and the companionship of the spirit rest and abide with each one of us through this week and even forevermore and God's people said amen
God bless family and friends and we'll see you next week two services 9 and 10:15 remember and tell your friends who are not here God bless <laughs>